Well, welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us today for the lecture series sponsored by both the Career Passport Program and the Career Passport Club. My name is Todd, and I'm the club president with the Career Passport Program. Um, if you're not familiar with either of those, um, you can see one of us in the club shirts, and we can get you more information um, on both the program and the club. Um, as far as announcements, some of you have flyers. You can refer to those of upcoming events. One thing that's not on the flyers is our upcoming club, Spring Social. It'll be on February 19th, 7 to 8.45 in the, ball, the Grand Ballroom. We'll have treats and be playing Human Battleship. Um, today we have the pleasure of hearing from President Holland, um, who's the president here at EVU. And so please join me in welcoming President Holland. Well, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, so it's, uh, it's a fun thing for me to be here today. I, uh, you know, I got into education because I love students. I love, you know, working with young people and thinking about life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness uh, with you. And I know that's uh, uh, what, what you're doing here. So I think uh, what I'm supposed to do today is talk a little bit about my career path and some of the processes I went through and how I thought about things and then then maybe just open it up for discussion about things you'd like to hear about and is that am I am I on script okay okay uh, so I guess my career um, was forged with uh, what I would consider a spectacular amount of indecision uh, that was uh, rescued in many ways by a uh, spectacular amount of effort. So uh, kudos to you. Half the battle is just what you're doing right now. Caring about it, thinking about it, even if you don't know. Uh, and sometimes that can be kind of a, a, a source of panic uh, in college, university life. I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to major in. Uh, and, and that grips a lot of people. But the thing that will compensate for that is just a lot of effort to prepare yourself to succeed wherever you may go. And so uh, I think I'm really being sort of more than just tongue in cheek about, I think that compensated for my lack of having a clear path uh, was, was, was overcome by a real sense of energy and passion about well, whatever I do, I, I wanna try to do it very well and I wanna get myself prepared to do well and it may be prepared to do a number of things but, and that was sort of my strategy. Now, that was true for me. I, um, it's not true for everybody. I, um, I used to joke about my brother-in-law. He and I were in the same uh, class at Brigham Young University. We are in the same major. We took some, some of the same courses together. And uh, he was there as, a, he was a political science major, uh, but as part of a pre-med program. He knew from the time he was 14 years old that he wanted to be a heart surgeon. And I remember just looking at him with envy. He was just, he just thought about it, he was preparing for it, and he did political science because he wanted to be a heart surgeon, but he wanted to be a well-educated one with this broad, you know, liberal arts background. And I just, I just so envious that he knew that and just could work and plan, and, and he's done it. And he's now a heart surgeon at Utah Valley Regional and has a great career and is doing magnificent things. And that's great. Um, and so for those of you that have a sense for what you want to do, um, uh, there's, a, there's kind of a way to approach it, but you're not going to learn that from me today, okay? <laughs> I'm here for you, sort of, I don't have a clue what I want to do, people, uh, or at least mostly don't know what you want to do. So uh, I went into, um, and, and here I am being a little bit facetious, I went to college sort of thinking I would go to law school. Uh, but this was with the idea that, not that I necessarily had a burning desire to practice law. I probably did have a little bit of a Perry Mason complex as a kid. I, you know, high courtroom drama and uh, put away the bad guys at the key moment and all that. Uh, but as I got older, I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm, that, that may or may not be a very accurate reflection of what it's like to practice law. And so, but I do, you know, I'm interested in, government, I'm interested in law, principles of justice, 
Um, I, I saw the law as good training. I talked to a lot of lawyers or saw a lot of lawyers who were doing other things than practicing the law, so it seemed like it was good preparation. So again, in that spirit of, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I do want to get more prepared. And so by part of my, what I meant by more prepared is I want more education. So I did know, I did decide fairly early on that I was going to at least go to college and almost surely do something beyond college, go to graduate school of some, of, at some point. And the, and the power of a law degree is that it could be a ticket or an entree into lots of different uh, areas to, to do things. So that was my, sort of my plan, and then I, you know, even in, in college, I was trying to figure out, well, what should I major in? And because, uh, you know, pre-law is not really a major, um, and I thought about, you know, economics, I thought about political science, I thought about history, that was a real love. Um, and then I thought, well, I probably should do some English. I knew that communication was important. I wanted to become a better writer. I wanted to become a better communicator. And so I really started to take English courses. They weren't really, frankly, my first love. But I learned that as I did more of them, I got better at it. And I kind of got into it. I became sort of a weirdo that actually liked to just read Shakespeare, even when you didn't have to. Very nerdy, I know. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it, that, that's kind of what happened with education. And then I kind of woke up my junior year and realized, you know, I got a lot of political science credit. I got a lot of English credit. Maybe th those should be my majors. So I'm probably a bad example to all of you because uh, I know right now we're focusing on pick your major early. And if you can, that's great because you really can get ahead of the curve. So if you can pick earlier, you should. Uh, but for me, it was a little bit of kind of getting in touch with what I gravitated to, what I liked. And I remember one day, I got a very good piece of advice uh, from someone. Uh, and uh, he was an economics professor at BYU. And I kept thinking, well, so much of the things that, you know, I may want to deal with in the law or government or uh, business or education will revolve around economics. So maybe I should study economics. And that's a kind of a true more of a true science than political science that masquerades as a science. <laughs> and uh, so I went to this economics professor. I said, I'm trying to decide between politi uh, political science and economics. And I was frankly just waiting for him to say, well, you know, there's no choice. Economics, it's the one true discipline. And what is political science after all? And, he's, he's, uh, and I had made a comment about, you know, I think, my, I think of the two I, I enjoy, I think about more about politics. He said, well, that's easy. You should study political science. As much as possible, you should do the things that you naturally gravitate to or that you love, that you think about. Because then you will, it won't be such a burden to get yourself prepared. Uh, and you'll enjoy doing your studies and you'll enjoy doing your projects. And that was really true. And I kind of realized I, I just would, you know, when I had some options, some electives, I would take more of these classes. And I said, okay, I'm going to make that my major. Political science will be my major, and I'll do English as a minor. And that, that was a real turning point for me. So I did the English because it was good for me. I did the political science because I loved it. And I think because I loved it, it's the kind of thing that, um, uh, you know, you wake up thinking about. Uh, you, you read about it, you know, in your time off, what, do you, what kind of books are you buying, what, what do you like to read in the newspaper, that sort of thing. As much as you can gravitate in those directions, you'll feel, more, not, not just that you'll feel more successful, you'll be more successful because you'll, you'll put extra time into it and it won't be, it won't be painful, it won't be a, a burden to you. And so that became my path uh, there. Now, so I get into my senior year and I'm thinking, okay, well, what am I going to do about law school? And so my dad, uh, who uh, is a pretty clever guy, actually, and who never wanted me to go to law school, uh, well, nothing against law school. You could, some of you may want to do that, but he didn't think it was, uh, that was the ideal thing for me. He said, Matt, just do me a favor. I want you to go to lunch, and I'll pay for the first one. You, you take five lawyers to lunch and ask them what they do f during the day for their job. I got through two lunches uh, and decided I don't want to do that. 
and it really was very eye-opening for me. So I had this kind of crisis my senior year uh, of college to say, I've been planning on law school. Now I don't want to go to law school. So what am I going to do? And uh, fortunately, uh, I was at a university like this one that had resources where you could find more out about stuff. And I went to talk to some people. And you kind of did the networking thing in the best sense of that word. I sometimes don't like the word networking, but because it sounds, makes, uh, it conjures up images of insincere flattery of people and whatnot. But there is something about just talking to people and getting advice and counseling with other people. And so I kind of went out to mentors and friends to say, hey, look, I was going to go to law school. I'm graduating. I'm not sure when. And someone in that ecosystem of mine sent me a brochure about management consulting. This, is, this had not been on my radar screen whatsoever. I didn't even know really the field existed, frankly. And um, they said, you know, a recruiter was in. They gave me this brochure. They're looking for some people. And I just thought about you. Uh, and so I looked through it, and I read of these bios. And, you know, I sort of had this, um, I grew up, you know, in this environment where uh, it seemed like business was what really practical people did, and if you were really serious about school, you did other, other things than business. And I looked at these bios, and these were really interesting people. And they were interesting lives, and they were well-educated, and they were working on interesting and important problems and figuring them out, um, and not to mention making some good money along the way. So I looked into that and decided, what the heck, I'm going to apply. And so I applied for that uh, job uh, and, and got it. Uh, and I took a little detour. I wanted, I simultaneously applied for that and then went to um, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. There was a one-year graduate program there to study leadership in Western democracies in an honor of a man named Raoul Wallenberg. It's a great inspirational story. I can tell you about it if you're interested. And so I had this dilemma. I ended up going to Israel. That was a great experience. A year after college, travel around the Middle East, uh, to have a little smattering of graduate school stuff. Because there was still part of me that said, I'm, I'm interested in this management consulting thing, but should I get a PhD in political science? Because uh, I wasn't going to go to law school. And Anyway, back and forth. Went to Israel, had a great experience. Still wasn't really sure that I was set for a, an academic life. Uh, so I thought, let's try this management consulting thing. Did it for a couple of years. Had a great experience. I learned a ton. There's probably not a week that goes by in my job here that I don't think about something that I learned in that job or some sort of experience that I had about leadership and management that was really useful. But every day I would come home from this job. I lived in Boston. I was single. And I should have been reading the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Business Week. And I would come home and I would pick up the ideological origins of the American Revolution. I had a sickness, OK? <laughs> and it, I finally embraced my own sickness, OK? And it was that, where does my mind gravitate towards? And my mind gravitated towards politics and history and philosophy. And I said, I got to do something about it. And I also knew that as much as I loved, you know, this kind of business environment and as lucrative as it was, that what my real passions were, were ideas and people and teaching. And that's what I, I, I thought to myself, look, if I, if I could only do one thing my entire life and I'm stuck with that one thing, since I tended to be someone who kind of wanted to do lots of different stuff, if I could just do one thing and I wanted to live a life that was fulfilling and was interesting, that life would be in education, particularly in, in a, a branch of political science that allows me to do kind of politics, philosophy, and history all at once. And so then I decided I got I to gotta go for it. And so that's when I um, uh, decided to get a PhD. And everybody in this firm that I worked for thought I was insane. Everybody else went to business school and basically went to Harvard Business School. And so for me to say, you know, I'm going to go get a PhD in political science, and, uh, uh, and I'm not going to, you know, do it in a Northeast setting. And people just thought I was throwing my life away. Um, but for me, it's the mix of those things that's made all the difference. Uh, it was having, 
you know, the openness to a different thing I wasn't expecting, management training, management consulting, then combined with an academic career, a PhD preparation, that's left me with, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, those things I was talking about, opportunities uh, to do different things. If I want to be a professor, I can be a professor. If I want to be an administrator, I at least have a, you know, a track for to be an administrator. Uh, with some administrative experience now, if I wanted to go back into the business world, I think I'd have an entree to do that. So um, there are some real limitations to not having a clear-cut idea from day one, but if you'll work at it and, and prepare yourself with a, the best education you can get in fields that relate to your passions but still give you a really good training about how to write, how to think, how to analyze, um, how to be critical uh, in terms of your response to the world without being negative, if you will, then those tools will serve you really well in a, any one of a number of, uh, of approaches. And in the process, again, talking to people. And so, you know, it was talking to people that opened up an opportunity I didn't think would exist in management consulting. Once I decided to go to graduate school, it was talking to my professors. How do you do this? How do you apply? Where should I apply? Um, once I got into a PhD program, it was how do I pick a dissertation topic and how do I turn this into a job? Because there aren't a lot of jobs out there for PhDs these days. And so just continually looking to people who've been there before, who can kind of show you the ropes and help you avoid the pitfalls. Because there are pitfalls in every career path. And there are pitfalls in every educational path. And there are a lot of people out there that are more than ready to help you avoid those pitfalls if you'll just extend yourself and talk to them. And not every conversation will be, you know, a, a, a huge grand revelation about what you should and shouldn't do. Just get in the habit of, of connecting with people and, and being forward enough without being a pest. You don't want to irritate people, but just to extend yourself to say, tell me a little bit about your career. Tell me a little bit about ways to proceed or prosper in this particular uh, line of work. And those kind of things build up over time in such a way that you really get a set of ideas behind you and an, a set of aspirations that can take you to places you, could, you just simply couldn't get there uh, on your own. So anyway, I got through, uh, I got through my uh, PhD program. And um, you know, I'll, I'll tell one quick uh, personal family story. And I can tell it because my wife's not here. Uh, so I, I met my wife uh, after my uh, first year of graduate school, and we kind of long distance dated through my second year of graduate school, and then got married so that I was starting my third year of graduate school as a married guy. And we got married July 20th, and she's from uh, Provo, and uh, August 20th, uh, I got the U-Haul loaded. We're in, uh, we're in, I'm in my in-law's driveway. It's August 20th, been a month of marriage. And she's standing on the doorstep, hugging her mom, and just sobbing uncontrollably as we head off to Durham, North Carolina. And I'm thinking to myself, does it seem that bad, you know, to, <laughs> to be going with me like this? And uh, so we get in the car, and uh, she stopped crying as we entered Kansas. And uh, <laughs> she turned to me, and she said, we're never coming back, are we? And I said, I don't think we are. Now, not literally, you know, we'd never return. I wasn't leaving hostile territory, but, but the idea was I did not go off to Duke University thinking I would come back to Brigham Young University. First of all, I didn't think it would practically be safe to bet on. There are very few academic, if you go on an academic career, you kind of have to be prepared to go virtually anywhere. And I also sort of had this thought about, you know, at a, some little sleepy liberal arts college town back east and reading the great books and... That would sort of be my thing. And uh, so I said, not really. And, and uh, anyway, fast forward the, the videotape or whatever it is we watch these days. I know it's not videotape anymore. But uh, we're pulling out of Durham, heading back to BYU. My wife's sobbing uncontrollably now. She doesn't want to go back now. She <laughs> loved Durham and our experience. So just so happened BYU had an opening uh, in my field at, at my time. 
Um, and I consider myself sort of lucky. And there is an element, frankly, of luck in so, sort of all this. But it's, um, uh, this is sometimes attributed to Steve Martin, sometimes Arnold Palmer, but, uh, and probably three or four others. But it's that definition of success is when luck meets preparation. I did get lucky. I, I have to admit it. But I also have to say I worked darn hard to be very well prepared. So that when that opportunity came up, I was the best prepared candidate for that, uh, for that opportunity. And so we came back to, um, to, to BYU, which was not expected, and I was on an academic path. I saw myself as a professor. I'd gotten out of the world of business and management and leadership and had gotten into the world of writing, research, and teaching. And uh, I loved it. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was uh, very stimulating for me. I loved working with students. I loved my research topics. I was publishing in areas that were meaningful to me and I was finding venues to get them published in and that's a very exciting rewarding kind of career and then one day someone knocked on my door at BYU and said hey there's this opening at UVU and you should throw your hat in the ring and I sort of chuckled because I didn't know UVU I wasn't planning on an administrative track everyone always assumes I would because my dad was a university administrator, but I was really sort of on this professorial path and, uh, and thought if academic administration comes, it comes a lot later. You know, I was two or three guys behind the department chair and then, and then it's a dean and then maybe you're an academic vice president when you're, you know, 65 or something. So uh, that's uh, sort of what, uh, where I saw myself headed at, at best. And they suggested this, you know, opportunity at UVU. And, uh, and I didn't know the institution. And so I didn't think much about it. Uh, and I, except I came home and I mentioned it to Paige. And she said, that's it. You'd be perfect. So the other lesson in life is marry well. Uh, <laughs> and marry someone smarter than you are, uh, which is what I did. Um, and she's intuitive, and she's bright, and she saw something instantly that I frankly didn't see. But that made my head snap. And I thought, well, okay, <laughs> maybe I better just think about this. And then a couple of other people talked to me about it. And I said, well, I'd at least find out. And then I started to you know, look into this, this uh, institution here that I drove by you know, a thousand times in my life and did not know at all. And my eyes were opened up to what a fantastic place this was and the exciting things that were happening and where it was headed and all of a sudden I thought well this is actually kind of intriguing to me and once again it was sort of talking to people and very quietly I wasn't campaigning for the job I was really just exploring and talking to people and the more I talked the more excited I got about it and the more excited I got the more people started to talk to me about you know what was what was going on here and what was happening and and it just kind of snowballed Gradually, again, without a lot of forethought, not a lot of, I'm going to, this is my plan, I'm going to make it happen, but just kind of responding to opportunities and, and having those opportunities match what was, again, a life of a lot of preparation. Uh, and so, in some ways, I was underprepared for the job. I had never been a department chairman. I'd never been a dean. But that, this is where having gone to the best graduate school I could go to, having the best publication record I could have, having had a couple of years of management consulting, gave me uh, some advantages that otherwise would have meant uh, for a guy like me, I wouldn't even have had a shot at the job. And so, again, those were things that happened not with some ultimate design in mind that I want to get to that particular job, but just that I knew I, had, I wanted to have several of these you know, strings in my bow, so to speak. So if the opportunities present themselves, I would be ready. And uh, so the regents uh, ran a process. They were obviously asleep at the wheel and uh, gave me the job. It's been a disaster ever since. Uh, not for me personally, but uh, for the rest of you. Uh, but uh, uh, actually, I have just loved being here at UVU. So anyway, that's a lot more than you want to know about Matt Holland, sort of Matt Holland ad nauseum here. So. But that is my story, and again, so much of life is learned from stories, listening to people, hearing their stories, and picking up something here and there. And I hope you know, you've gleaned something. Your path will not be Matt Holland's path. That's the one thing you need to know in these moments, is when you go listen to someone, 
who's been there and done that and whatnot. I would really have you resist the urge, that's me, I want to do just that. Well, you, you can't. I couldn't have done that. It wouldn't have worked. But hopefully you will have heard something here today that will say, you know, there's a little something there that I could glean from that, or I could do a little bit better, or I could think about this way that will, will help uh, move you through. So that's my only hope in terms of what you may get uh, from that story. Um, with that said, let me just uh, open it up here and, you know, let you ask some questions about anything I've said or other things that are on your mind about career, uh, about education, uh, as well as just, you know, things going on here uh, at UVU, you know, kind of the time's yours, and I'm happy to be at your disposal for a while. So what's on your mind? Okay, so it's, I have two questions. How long is the term of a president of a university? And then when you do finish your term, if you choose to, I'm not sure how it works out, what will you do afterwards? Yeah. So I went from the world's safest job, <laughs> tenure at BYU, uh, to the world's most dangerous job. Uh, I serve at the will of the regents. They, I don't have a contract. They could fire me tomorrow if I screw it up. Uh, and that was a little bit nerve-wracking to say to wife and kids, you know, I've, I've had this job I can have in perpetuity to this job where there's a, you know, high profile and a lot of different constituencies. You can't please everybody and you got to make it work. Um, so uh, I said to the regents when I was going through the job search, because I got asked that, they said, if we give you this job, how long do you think you'll stay? Because I think there was some worry about, well, here's a guy jumping out of the ranks of junior professors. He just on some fast tracking path to go somewhere else. And I said, I think that for a job like this, this is a large, complex institution, uh, to really f even just figure out the job, you kind of just have to be here for about a year. And then to really get some things done, it probably takes about five years to really kind of give some shape and direction. And, and then uh, you can't just up and leave, and you need to think about if you're really being responsible for an organization you need to think about a, a year of transition. So that would be seven years. So um, as, as some of the uh, staff that are here today can tell you, I've said publicly this last summer, I kind of told that same story and said, now I'm going into my fifth year. I'm halfway through my fifth year. And to think about seven years, that seems way too short now. <laughs> so I've said, I think I've got at least you know, four more years, kind of a second term. I've done four. I know what we were able to get done. I can see at least another clear four years of work ahead of me, and, and maybe another term after that if it's working for me and for the institution. At some point, I think it's just healthy, even when it's working well and successful, to rotate you know, jobs. And that's the other thing I would encourage people to say is, you know, don't, I'd really resist thinking about the 25, 30 year career in something. Think about, you know, being fresh and moving and developing, and, and uh, I just think it's, it's kind of a safer path and it's also a more interesting path. So anyway, that's a long answer to say um, I'm, I'm here for another, you know, four to five years. Uh, now, having said that, if some other opportunity came along that I couldn't resist or, or that i not foreseen right now, uh, I, you know, I, regions haven't given me a contract, I'm not giving them a hard promise. But, my mind is focused every single day on how we get UVU ready for our 75th anniversary, which is basically four years away. Then after that, as I say, maybe it's another four years, maybe it's another term, or maybe it's something else. Once again, captain of indecision has no idea what that may be. Uh, and so far, I've, it's worked out, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, but uh, it could be lots of different things. It could be another you know, uh, presidency, it could stay in kind of the path I'm on, or maybe it's going into business, or maybe there's some civic, you know, kind of project that I get excited about that I'd want to do. So, uh, as you can tell, you know, one of the great liabilities I have in my home life is that money has never been my primary motivator. So, I'm, I'm as, you know, uh, I have material needs just like everybody else uh, in the world. I'm not some saint that way, but I did make a decision fairly early on in life that there were other things that were at least as important to me or more important to me than making money. And so I, whatever I do, I'm going to have to feel a real sense of passion and, and vision about doing it, if at all possible. So, yeah. 
Um, with all of the, the time and effort and work that you've put in to get to where you are now, if you could pinpoint maybe one or a few things as to how you were able to balance your life and not only balance your life out, but to really excel and become successful. Okay, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and I, it's, it's an important question and one I'm still asking myself and wrestling with. I, one of the ways I like to first answer that is to tell an anecdote of a situation where I was in a setting much like this. It was a little different, it was an ecclesiastical setting, but it turned into a QA and a uh, with uh, Mitt Romney. I was working back in Boston when Mitt Romney was back there and I was in a situation where he was an ecclesiastical leader. And so he was over a large multi-unit uh, congregation of, uh, of believers that I belong to. Uh, and that was one of the things that he did, and that was probably a 20-hour-a-week assignment. Um, he was head of Bain Capital and rescuing this floundering financial organization that was literally going down this, the tubes. And uh, people were screaming and lawsuits were being threatened, and he had to get it turned around. Uh, and he had uh, a marriage and five sons. And so someone asked him, he said, well, Mitt, how do you, how do you find uh, uh, balance in all that? And he said, well, I don't know much about balance. I just know that when my wife, my partners at Bain, and my counselors in my ecclesiastical setting are all equally mad at me, I'm doing it about right. <laughs> uh, now, that's a little pessimistic way of looking at it, but there is an element of truth to it. I mean, there is... I, my wife and kids have sacrificed. Uh, I'm not home as much as I would like to be home. Uh, on the other hand, there are moments where I disappoint people on this campus because I don't go to their event because I want to go to my daughter's recital or, you know, a camp out with my son. Um, and so they're, they're just real trade-offs and sometimes they're pretty painful. You know you're leaving money on the table professionally because you're choosing to do stuff with your family. Alternatively, you know you're home and your wife's exhausted, in my case, and my kids are missing me, but I've, I feel I've gotta be somewhere and I gotta put in the extra hours and I go in on a Saturday morning and uh, that's the only way it's worked for me. I'm not smart enough to succeed on a nine to five schedule. And I warned my wife when we got married, I said, if you want a nine to five guy, I just, as much as I love you, I'm not your guy. Uh, so that's just part of the equation. And so it, it's a real mix and, and it can change over time. You know, it can have its peaks and valleys. You know, I'm in a moment right now where I got two teenage kids and they're not gonna be with me much longer. And every day we're making some choices where I know I'm irritating people on this campus with stuff I'm not getting to, but I'm just, I'm just gonna take that time. Uh, and then there are other moments where you say, you know, uh, I, I, gotta, I gotta dig into the family capital to really invest on the professional front to make it work. And especially early on, you know, those days of graduate school, those were tough days. We had no money. I was gone all the time. And the prospect of me hitting it big as a political science professor, not very promising. Uh, but my wife, uh, we were partners in it. We talked about it. Uh, we were mutually agreed about what, uh, what it could potentially lead to and what the risks were, and so we made those investments. And so you just have to get very real with yourself and with the people who are closest to you about where you want to go and what you're willing to do to do it, and then keep those lines of communication open. And uh, I think if you do that, and if you keep talking through it, and you're willing to have some back and forth and be open you know, to, to the moment where you get your knuckles wrapped by your partner who says you're, you're screwing up right now, okay, and we need to talk, um, you, can, you can make it work. Um, but it, it, will, it will require at times some, some hard, hard choices. So. Well, on that somber note, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As far as the, you briefly mentioned networking, how yeah. do you keep that in perspective as far as Oh, now I'm nervous. <laughs> as far as far as um, uh, looking at networking for what it is and yeah. helping you get along the way, but then also keeping it so that you're not just uh, being yeah. selfish. Sure. I yeah. Well, it's a it, that's a it's a it's a great question. Again, you guys are all these are great questions. There, there's kind of an art to it. Here are a couple of principles I think that are involved. Uh, you you can all think about a term uh, that that works for you, whatever 
your ethical, moral, religious framework may be. But I'll just use a simple term for me, and that's love, uh, which is if you try to go through life genuinely caring about other people as much as you care about yourself, that's half the battle. Too often what happens in a network setting is there's some guy out there and it's just all about him or her, okay? And they're moving and they're shaking and they're talking and they're handing out business cards because it's all about them. And the greatest, I think, you know, antidote to that and to not becoming that person is to really genuinely step back and say, yeah, my life matters, but so does everybody else's life in this room that I'm with right now. And what are their worries and their concerns? Now, there's a power in that because I think it makes you a better networker. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, when people can tell that this, is, this person's not just in it for them, but they've got a broader viewpoint, you come across better, I think. And, and people are in some ways more willing to help you because it isn't just all, all about you. So that's, you know, call it love, call it charity, call it ethical concern for the other, you know, pick whatever your particular construct may be, but get outside of yourself for a minute and, and, and just think about, you know, when I'm entering a conversation, what does that person need? And not just because if I help them, they'll help me, but because they're a, they're a human being and they have infinite dignity and respect and, or I should have infinite dignity and respect for them and, and, and that, that'll help you. So that's one principle. And the other principle is just to find, you know, that sort of wellspring of confidence. You know, some people, if, if, if one end of the spectrum is, is the person who's just out there all the time for themselves 24-7, the other end of the spectrum is the person who kind of has a hard time extending themselves and striking up the conversation. And so to that person, I would say there is a kind of a confidence principle. And for me, you know, people can sit back when it comes to profession and say, well, I'm either confident or not confident, that's who I am. I don't buy that. I'm, in this sense, I'm an old Aristotelian. Aristotle taught this view. If you want to, if you feel you lack a certain virtue, you just go practice it. You feel you lack confidence, you go practice doing confident things. And you'll be amazed at how that can bring a greater level of confidence in your life. So if you kind of feel a little reticent on the networking side, you push yourself and say, I'm gonna make myself do it. And, and it may be a little formulaic and it may feel a little forced at first, but as you do it and you keep doing it, as Aristotle teaches us, you'll, you'll become better in the performing of it by virtue of practicing it. And so I think that combination, if I were to boil it down to two principles of making sure you're, you're pushing yourself with some confidence, but having a, just a genuine respect for other people, and you'll, you'll navigate that just fine. So. Yeah. We probably have time for one more question. Yours. <laughs> I, always, I always seem to get the last question. But, um, so my question is... Uh-oh, it's written out. I okay. know. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. So I liked how you had all these different directions, and to me I have a bunch of different skill levels. Yeah. And I want to... How would you... How would you best, if you had a, a very eclectic group of skill sets, yeah. and you kind of knew where you would use it, but you don't know how to get from this point to that point? Yeah. What? I mean. Okay. Uh, well, that's that's a good question that I can relate to. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, even as I joke about indecision and not being sure, you, there there do come moments where you have to make some choices. And so one of the things you probably do want to do is make sure that you're setting some benchmark moments say, uh, I do at some point want to choose a major, not have someone just hand me a university you know, degree that I didn't pick for myself. So, um, and, and in the choosing of that, that can help, that can help you know, focus your attention and your, your perspective. So uh, it, you may not know exactly what you want to do right now in your college experience, but at some point if you can say, at least for the next step, I can't see 30 years down the road, but for the next five to 10 years, this is, uh, I'm, I'm probably headed to graduate school, or I'm probably headed to this industry, or I'm headed to this profession, or whatnot, and, and at least get you know, some incremental markers for you that say, well, if that's the case, then I should be doing X, Y, and Z. I'm still doing three things, but I'm probably not gonna spend as much time on A, B, and C. 
Because there is a danger in the model that I've talked about, which is that you, you do get so eclectic and so diffuse that you never really focus. Uh, and, and that's ultimately what happened to me. I started with this big, broad, you know, multiple majors, multiple careers, and then all of a sudden, I'm spending six years on Durham writing on a topic that I now know more about than anybody in the world. Uh, uh, because I just sit in my library all day and read about that thing. So at some point you do have to focus, you have to develop some expertise, you have to not try to be all things to all people because that really can be a rate limiting factor in your ability to progress. And, 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 and again, talking to people in those areas where you're interested. So if you can pick some targets, whether it's graduate school and industry, and then go talk to people, say, how did you best prepare for that? then they can help give you some of those embankments to, to retain as you pick a little more focused path moving forward, so. Okay, did you have a question? I'll take one more quickly. I'll be quick, I don't okay. need a microphone, I'll yeah. talk loud enough. Um, Hang on, we're recording. So oh, okay, yeah. I don't want to talk into it. <laughs> Obviously someone in your position doesn't get somewhere without leadership skills, okay? So I wanna know what you think are some of the important leadership skills that you have, and then what's a leadership skill you wish you were better at? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, leadership skills do matter, um, and I also believe in the spirit of my comments about Aristotle, they can be learned. Uh, my great colleague Kyle Reyes is back uh, there with me. He studies leadership too at the U of U, uh, and uh, one of the things we've done here is we've developed a leadership program for campus where we've picked, you know, half a dozen core leadership, we call them leadership competencies. Um, and now. That, that, in some ways, that's, a, that's an extended way of getting at, at your, your question. In some ways, leadership really depends upon the organization that you're in. Uh, Kyle and I have designed this leadership you know, training program for UVU. Um, I don't think it would be the optimal training program for um, the Marines, okay? Uh, there, there are certain organizations that have a certain need, a certain aim that may require for one style of leadership over another. So I'm always a little bit suspicious about, quote, broadly universal principles of leadership for all time and everywhere. I think there, there probably are some, but then they have to be tailored to the particular industry, the particular organization. Might be one thing in a church setting, might be one thing in a public setting, might be one thing in a private business setting, might be one thing in a military setting and all that, has to, all that has to be taken into account. So uh, that's, that's one point. Um, the second point is I do think that, um, uh, you know, in terms of some things that tend to cut, ac tend to cut across a lot of divides, uh, and I, I think you were asking sort of something I've worked on and maybe something I want to get even better at. So one thing that's just vital for a leader is communication and an ability to, uh, to kind of tell an organization uh, what you're thinking, where you need to go, what the difficulties are, and so that means you know, some facilitation with words, means some facilitation with uh, media, you know, can you write, can you speak, can you, you know, conduct yourself in a group setting, can you project? Uh, so there are a lot of components to that, and I think anybody who aspires to leadership ought to be working on communication skills. It is one of the reasons why I studied English, even though that wasn't maybe a natural love of mine, is that I wanted to read a lot, I wanted to get better with words, I wanted to think about how to write better, and I think that served me very well, both in business settings and in academic settings. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, one area. You know, if there were areas that I'm, I'm working on, you know, the kind of the details on uh, on the mechanical side of things, you know, budgets and, and uh, things like that. I'm not the world's greatest expert. So I think in those things you do two things. You've got to be proficient enough. Uh, you can't just be blind to those things. And I think I'm proficient enough, though I'm working on getting even more proficient. And you learn, you get good people around you who fill those holes for you. So part of my successes, to the extent I've had them, is I'm surrounded by a terrific team that fill in you know, where, where my skill set isn't as strong. And so that may be, just to wrap it up, a, th a third point, which is you've got to be self-aware enough to accept, yeah, I'm pretty good at that, and I'm going to work on, I'm going to use that to my advantage. But here I probably need a little bit more help, and I'm going to go find, A, I'm going to recognize that I need that help, 
and B, I'm going to go find the people who can fill that out for me. And so uh, that's, that's, that's what I do. So. Okay? All right. Thank you. Great group. Appreciate it. <laughs>